Merry Christmas. Welcome to Christ Church Lutheran. We are so glad you have decided to join us this morning. My name is Jeff. I am a member of the staff here in Phoenix, Arizona, and we are so excited to celebrate the advent of our Lord's arrival, and we pray that this Christmas season has been a blessing to you, that you are filled with the hope and joy that comes with our Lord's arrival. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we draw near to our newborn King, we gather around his manger. He is God's love in the flesh. He earnestly desires to bring an end to our struggle with sin, and his grace grants us forgiveness. Confident in God's love for us through Christ Jesus, we confess our sins before God and one another. Please speak with me. Father, we humbly bow before you. We are unworthy of your love because we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. Yet in the midst of our failings, you have given us the gift of your only son as our infant savior to both live and die for us. Forgive our sin and fill us with the everlasting peace that comes through Jesus who was laid to rest in the manger and shed his blood on the cross. Amen. The separation between God and man, woman and child has been healed by Jesus Christ. He was born in our midst, died and rose to give us eternal peace. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I announce to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's peace be with you, and also with you. 
Merry Christmas. My name is Corinne Salander and I'm one of the teachers here at CLS. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went there, everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Merry Christmas. My name is Tyler Hathaway, and I have the awesome privilege of teaching junior high here at Christ Lutheran School. Our second reading for today comes from the book of Luke, the second chapter, verses 8 through 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared to th with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests.
Merry Christmas. My name is Randy Greeter, and I am a teacher here at Christ Lutheran School. The final reading is, When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and a baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Merry Christmas to all of you. I, I pray that this time is uh, filled with joy and peace, that you are overwhelmed with Christmas spirit as we gather together really to celebrate the greatest gift that has ever been given, just as Christians have done for hundreds of years. And really that kind of begs the question that I want to ask to all of you this morning. The question is this, have you ever wondered why we celebrate Christmas at the end of December? Why do we celebrate Christ's birthday tomorrow? Now you've probably heard the popular idea surrounding the holiday. The idea is this, that the Christians in Rome uh, re repurposed, appropriated the winter solstice, the pagan celebration of spring coming. They repurposed that in order to kind of halt the spread of the pagan influence and to introduce Christianity into a Roman society. Now maybe that's true. I don't know because I wasn't there when the decision was made, but the theory does make a little bit of sense, right? Here's what we do know. The celebration of Christ's birth as a formal holiday really didn't begin until somewhere in the second or third century, a couple hundred years after Christ's ascension. If you've read through the Bible, then you've probably noted that there are only two birth narratives given in the whole New Testament. And of those two narratives, we don't really get a lot of detail regarding the exact date. On the other hand, the passion of our Lord, his arrest, his trial, his suffering, death and resurrection, Good Friday and Easter were celebrated by the church long before we celebrated Christmas. The dating was late March, or early April for Christ's Passion, and that arguably was celebrated as early as the first century. Now, I know it probably sounds like I'm preaching a Lenten sermon on Christmas Eve, but bear with me because I think I'm getting to a point. That time frame of Christ's Passion, late March, early April, is noteworthy. And it brings us to the second theory behind why we celebrate Christ's birth on December 25th and hopefully to my point. I want to read to you from Philippians 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Certainly this is an unusual text to read and preach on on Christmas Eve, but this has been an unusual year, so all bets are off. You see, the early church had an interesting belief regarding Good Friday. They believed that the day of Christ's death was the same day of his immaculate conception. So if they believed that Christ died on or around the end of March or early April, then you do some very basic math, you move forward nine months, and you arrive at late December or early January, as the date of his birth. And so here we are, a couple thousand years later, celebrating Christ's birth 
on December 25th. And really, I, I think what's behind this point is important. Because all of these things we celebrate, the nativity and the story of the incarnation, the gifts, the songs, all the things that we hold dear during this time of year, find their fulfillment in Easter. They find their fulfillment in the cross of Jesus Christ. This is where all of our celebrating leads. Even as I preach to you, the symbol of his cross hangs behind me. It hangs around my neck. It is the symbol of our hope. To, cre to preach Christ's birth, the miracle and mystery of Christmas, is to preach the triumph of Easter. It was for that reason that God sent his beloved son, the high king of heaven, that in his willingness to humble himself to our humanity, to become a servant, God would reveal the mystery and depth of his love for us at the cross. A baby born in a manger, a symbol of innocence and weakness, has become our symbol of strength and hope. What a wonderful mystery. So we celebrate the great mystery of the incarnation because the promise of the incarnation is the certainty of our salvation. Our God has broken into our world and done a miraculous thing. So my invitation to you this morning is to cling to the baby in the manger, worship at his manger, revel in the mystery of the incarnation, rejoice at your Lord's arrival, rejoice for your God has come near to you, Rejoice for salvation is here. To him be all glory forever and ever. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. My name is Dave Schmidt. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Church Lutheran. The angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the city of David, a savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. One of the things I love to do at this season of the year is to look through Christmas cards with my wife. We love to get reconnected with our family and friends and find out the events of their life and just get caught up. And what I notice in these Christmas cards is usually it's a tranquil, serene setting on the front of it, almost an idyllic setting where everything's perfect. And even our Christmas carols, we sing about all is calm and all is bright. But the reality is, Jesus was born in a filthy barn with barnyard animals placed in a feeding trough. The people were heavily taxed. There was a dictator who was ruthless and brutal by the name of Herod. There were thousands of people traveling because of an edict, a decree by Caesar Augustus. There were many attempts made to kill this newborn child. Mary and Joseph were far from their family and friends, back up in Nazareth, and they had to flee to Egypt for two years to escape the wrath of King Herod. I don't know which version of the Christmas story you prefer, the sanitized version or the version that is, but if your life is not quite perfect, if it's not idyllic in Christmas of 2020, take hope, a light has dawned. A lot of churches right now will read from Isaiah chapter nine. To us, a child is born, and to us, a son is given, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But very rarely will you read the first five verses of chapter nine in Isaiah. First five verses talk about those who are in distress. Are you in distress this Christmas? Maybe all is not calm and all is not bright. Isaiah one through five also talks about those walking in darkness and those who live in the shadow of death. And maybe that's a little closer to home. This has been a hard year. This is a painful season. People are hurting. People are in distress. Well, I have good news. If your life doesn't resemble the front of most of these Christmas cards, I'd like to introduce you to some of the names of this newborn child. 
For those who are in distress, the Bible says that the Prince of Peace has arrived. And peace does not mean that there is an absence of conflict or struggle or pain or trials. Peace means God's presence in the midst of pain. Paul wrote about this peace that passes all understanding from a prison cell. Daniel experienced this peace walking among the lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experienced this peace in the middle of a fiery furnace. And this peace is yours through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Are you in darkness this season? Well, let me introduce you to another name for this newborn child, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. And right before he ascended to heaven at the end of his earthly ministry, he said, lo, I am with you always. If you're in darkness, you can cling to Emmanuel. He is an ever-present help in trouble. Or perhaps you're walking in the shadow of death, as Isaiah 9 would describe in the first few verses. Well, let me introduce you to my favorite name for this newborn child, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Make no mistake, it's not all about a cradle. It's all about a cross where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died and suffered that we might have eternal life. Do not be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. Amen. Merry Christmas. My name is Jeff. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here, and we pray that today is a day of great encouragement for you, a day of great encouragement in an unusual year. And we've heard two words again and again in this year. We've heard the word unprecedented, and we've heard the word essential, unprecedented and essential. It's true that the experiences we're experiencing in our lifetimes maybe are unprecedented. We look on Christmas to consider the reality that what a crazy way to save the world. Would you suggest that it's unprecedented that God would send his son in the form of a baby to a small town to be born in such a fashion in a barn, if you will, in an animal's stable? It's unprecedented, but it's precisely because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son in that way that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. And the second word is essential. Essential. The word means absolutely necessary, extremely important. What a fascinating evaluation we've had over these past almost 10 months now. I'm going to ask you, what's essential for Christmas? We're going to take the little essential Christmas test. Is this essential? I want you to kind of shout out loud at wherever you're listening whether or not something's essential or non-essential. Is this essential? Christmas tree. Yeah, I say it's essential. What about this? Is this essential? Yes, Christmas cookies. What about this? Is this essential? Eh, no. Fruitcake, not essential for me, anyway. What about this? Essential? Lights, yes, essential. And what about this? Essential? Eh, not for me. Lutefisk, I'm not a fan of lutefisk, even though the upper Midwest likes lutefisk. What about Christmas Eve candlelight services? Essential. Yes, for me, Christmas... These things that are essential are essential, and I'm going to encourage you to consider the question of what's the essential life test? I believe we've all been going through, in the whole world, what's essential to our lives, really? What's essential in this time? Some of us have been evaluated as if we are non-essential because we have a non-essential job, whatever that fundamentally means. I'm, I'm going to say to you, you are essential. You are important and absolutely necessary, because that's why Jesus Christ came. And in this particular year, I'm going to suggest to you there are at least three things that we've become reinforced again and again that are 
essential. The first, people. How many people are in your life? And how are the people doing in your life? How are you really doing? And the people you love, some of them are celebrating Christmas today and some of them are not celebrating Christmas. Some of them have had the very same difficult pandemic year we're experiencing, but they don't have Jesus. They don't know him. Might I encourage you as you love them, as you care for them, as you pray for them, maybe reach out to them with grace and mercy even today. People. Because people will last. Not only will they last on this side of eternity, but they will last on the other side. And to receive eternal life, we trust in Christ, and therefore we have heaven. There are those like me who grieve people this particular season. I like to think about them being in heaven. I pray that you have the comfort that those who trust in Christ are in eternity, the people of your life who have left this life. But I pray that the people who are still in this life, that you love them, that you encourage them, that you build them up. The second essential thing beyond this life in terms of is people is faith. Faith. Now, people maybe have taken away from you in this particular period of time some of your freedoms in terms of your freedom of access, freedom of, of accessibility, things you had to cancel this past year, but nobody can cancel your faith. No one can take away what fundamentally matters. Things don't really matter. Candidly, where you live doesn't matter. How much, you, how much stuff you have really doesn't matter. But faith, your trust in the truth that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If anything is true in this year, it's the fact that we've been given the gift of God's grace in Jesus Christ again. And there's a third. Hope. How hopeful are you, really? I want to really kind of check in. Now, I recognize you can't really say to the people at your Christmas celebration that you're not really that hopeful, but you can say it to God. Hope is the confident expectation that God has acted and will act and will continue to act. And so, therefore, I can be hopeful, not in a Pollyanna way, but in a real way. Because the God who came in such a crazy way to save the world has said to you, I'm not leaving you. I am present with you. Your life is sacred. Your life has meaning and purpose and value. And I love you. Unprecedented. It's true. Jesus Christ came in an unprecedented way. We're living in an unprecedented year, but essential. If you've ever felt you are not essential, I change all of that and recognize your value has been shown in what God did for you in Christ. I pray that this is a tremendous Christmas Eve for you. I pray that as if you are in the comfort of your own home, hearing these words, that you know that God wants to give you his faith, his trust, he wants you to have faith in him and trust in him, and he wants to give you hope, a confident expectation that he has acted and he will continue to act. I pray for a blessed Christmas for you. I pray for all the details that you only are thinking about in your mind even now, and you can trust and you can believe that he will be present, for indeed the message of Christmas is God with us. God, with you, a blessed Christmas, an essential Christmas, an unprecedented Christmas in an unprecedented year. God bless you. God's peace to you. Please pray with me. Lord God, we give you thanks for this year. We give you thanks that you have not left us in this year. We give you thanks for the people in our life this Christmas Eve. We give you thanks for the gift of faith, and we give you thanks that you are the God who grants us again hope, 
hope, confidence, expectancy, joy, gladness of heart. Give us continually that Christmas hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas. As a part of the tradition of Christmas Eve, I encourage you to have a candle with you in your home, and there's others with you. Take candles that we can light them. We're going to lower the lights here in this room now as you can, as we are going to light the candles and sing Silent Night on this holy night of Christmas Eve. Please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On this Christmas Eve, receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you. Merry Christmas. <laughs>